The cinema of the United States, often metonymously referred to as Hollywood, has had a profound effect on the film industry in general since the early 20th century. The dominant style of American cinema is classical Hollywood cinema, which developed from 1917 to 1960 and characterizes most films made there to this day. While Frenchman Auguste and Louis Lumière are generally credited with the birth of modern cinema, American cinema quickly came to be the most dominant force in the industry as it emerged. It produces the largest number of films of any single language national cinema, with more than 800 English language films released on average every year. While the national cinemas of the United Kingdom 299, Canada 206, Australia and New Zealand also produce films in the same language, they are not considered part of the Hollywood system. Hollywood has also been considered a transnational cinema. Classical Hollywood produced multiple language versions of some titles, often in Spanish or French. Contemporary Hollywood offshores production to Canada, Australia and New Zealand. Hollywood is the oldest film industry in the world, and is considered the birthplace of various genres of cinema—among them comedy, drama, action, the musical, romance, horror, science fiction and the war epic—having set an example for other national film industries. In 1878, Edward Muybridge demonstrated the power of photography to capture motion. In 1894, the world's first commercial motion picture exhibition was given in New York City, using Thomas Edison's kinetoscope. The United States produced the world's first sing sound musical film, The Jazz Singer, in 1927, and was at the forefront of sound film development in the following decades. Since the early 20th century, the U.S. film industry has largely been based in and around the 30 mile zone in Hollywood, Los Angeles, California. Director D. W. Griffith was central to the development of a film grammar. Orson Welles's Citizen Kane 1941 is frequently cited in critics' polls as the greatest film of all time. The major film studios of Hollywood are the primary source of the most commercially successful and most ticket-selling movies in the world, such as The Birth of a Nation 1915, Gone with the Wind 1939, The Sound of Music 1965, The Godfather 1970 Jaws 1975, Star Wars 1977, E.T. the Extraterrestrial 1982, Jurassic Park 1993, Titanic 1997, and Avatar 2009. Moreover, many of Hollywood's highest-grossing movies have generated more box office revenue and ticket sales outside the United States than films made elsewhere. Today, American film studios collectively generate several hundred movies every year, making the United States one of the most prolific producers of films in the world and a leading pioneer in motion picture engineering and technology. Topic History Topic <inaudible> Origins and Fort Lee The first recorded instance of photographs capturing and reproducing motion was a series of photographs of a running horse by Edward Muybridge, which he took in Palo Alto, California using a set of still cameras placed in a row. Muybridge's accomplishment led inventors everywhere to attempt to make similar devices. In the United States, Thomas Edison was among the first to produce such a device, the kinetoscope. 
The history of cinema in the United States can trace its roots to the East Coast where, at one time, Fort Lee, New Jersey was the motion picture capital of America. The industry got its start at the end of the 19th century with the construction of Thomas Edison's Black Maria, the first motion picture studio in West Orange, New Jersey. The cities and towns on the Hudson River and Hudson Palisades offered land at costs considerably less than New York City across the river and benefited greatly as a result of the phenomenal growth of the film industry at the turn of the 20th century. The industry began attracting both capital and an innovative workforce, and when the Callum Company began using Fort Lee in 1907 as a location for filming in the area, other film filmmakers quickly followed. In 1909, a forerunner of Universal Studios, the Champion Film Company, built the first studio. Others quickly followed and either built new studios or who leased facilities in Fort Lee. In the 1910s and 1920s, film companies such as the Independent Moving Pictures Company, Peerless Studios, the Solax Company, Eclair Studios, Goldwyn Picture Corporation, American Malise Star Films, World Film Company, Biograph Studios, Fox Film Corporation, Pathé Frères, Metro Pictures Corporation, Victor Film Company, and Selznick Pictures Corporation were all making pictures in Fort Lee. Such notables as Mary Pickford got their start at Biograph Studios, in New York, the Kaufman Astoria Studios in Queens, was built during the silent film era, was used by the Marx Brothers and W.C. Fields. The Edison Studios were located in the Bronx. Chelsea, Manhattan was also frequently used. Picture City Florida was also a planned site for a movie picture production center in the 1920s, but due to the 1928 Okeechobee hurricane, the idea collapsed and Picture City returned to its original name of Hobe Sound. Other major centers of film production also included Chicago, Texas, California, and Cuba. The film patents wars of the early 20th century led to the spread of film companies across the U.S. Many worked with equipment for which they did not own the rights and thus filming in New York could be dangerous. It was close to Edison's company headquarters, and to agents the company set out to seize cameras. By 1912, most major film companies had set up production facilities in Southern California near or in Los Angeles because of the region's favorable year-round weather. <laughs> Rise of Hollywood In early 1910, director D. W. Griffith was sent by the Biograph Company to the West Coast with his acting troupe, consisting of actors Blanche Sweet, Lillian Gish, Mary Pickford, Lionel Barrymore and others. They started filming on a vacant lot near Georgia Street in downtown Los Angeles. While there, the company decided to explore new territories, traveling several miles north to Hollywood, a little village that was friendly and enjoyed the movie company filming there. Griffith then filmed the first movie ever shot in Hollywood, in Old California, a biograph melodrama about California in the 19th century, when it belonged to Mexico. Griffith stayed there for months and made several films before returning to New York. After hearing about Griffith's success in Hollywood, in 1913, many movie makers headed west to avoid the fees imposed by Thomas Edison, who owned patents on the movie-making process. Nestor Studios of Bayonne, New Jersey, built the first studio in Hollywood in 1911. 
Nestor Studios, owned by David and William Horsley, later merged with Universal Studios, and William Horsley's other company, Hollywood Film Laboratory, is now the oldest existing company in Hollywood, now called the Hollywood Digital Laboratory. California's more hospitable and cost-effective climate led to the eventual shift of virtually all filmmaking to the West Coast by the 1930s. At the time, Thomas Edison owned almost all the patents relevant to motion picture production and movie producers on the East Coast acting independently of Edison's motion picture patents company were often sued or enjoined by Edison and his agents while movie makers working on the West Coast could work independently of Edison's control. In Los Angeles, the studios and Hollywood grew. Before World War I, movies were made in several U.S. cities, but filmmakers tended to gravitate towards Southern California as the industry developed. They were attracted by the warm climate and reliable sunlight, which made it possible to film movies outdoors year-round and by the varied scenery that was available. There are several starting points for cinema, particularly American cinema, but it was Griffith's controversial 1915 epic Birth of a Nation that pioneered the worldwide filming vocabulary that still dominates celluloid to this day. In the early 20th century, when the medium was new, many Jewish immigrants found employment in the U.S. film industry. They were able to make their mark in a brand new business, the exhibition of short films in storefront theaters called Nickelodeons, after their admission price of a nickel five cents. Within a few years, ambitious men like Samuel Goldwyn, William Fox, Carl Lemley, Adolf Zukor, Louis B. Mayer, and the Warner Brothers Harry, Albert, Samuel, and Jack had switched to the production side of the business. Soon they were the heads of a new kind of enterprise, the movie studio. The U.S. had at least one female director, producer and studio head in these early years, French-born director Alice Guy Blachet. They also set the stage for the industry's internationalism. The industry is often accused of Amero-centric provincialism. Other moviemakers arrived from Europe after World War I, directors like Ernst Lubitsch, Alfred Hitchcock, Fritz Lang and Jean Renoir, and actors like Rudolf Valentino, Marlene Dietrich, Ronald Coleman, and Charles Boyer. They joined a homegrown supply of actors. Lured west from the New York City stage after the introduction of sound films to form one of the 20th century's most remarkable growth industries. At Motion Picture's height of popularity in the mid-1940s, the studios were cranking out a total of about 400 movies a year, seen by an audience of 90 million Americans per week. Sound also became widely used in Hollywood in the late 1920s. After The Jazz Singer, the first film with synchronized voices was successfully released as a Vitaphone talkie in 1927. Hollywood film companies would respond to Warner Brothers and begin to use Vitaphone sound which Warner Brothers owned until 1928 in future films. By May 1928, Electrical Research Product Incorporated ERPI, a subsidiary of the Western Electric Company, gained a monopoly over film sound distribution. A side effect of the talkies was that many actors who had made their careers in silent films suddenly found themselves out of work, as they often had bad voices or could not remember their lines. Meanwhile, in 1922, U.S. politician Will H. Hayes left politics and formed the movie studio boss organization known as the Motion Picture Producers and Distributors of America MPPDA. 
The organization became the Motion Picture Association of America after Hayes retired in 1945. In the early times of talkies, American studios found that their sound productions were rejected in foreign language markets and even among speakers of other dialects of English. The synchronization technology was still too primitive for dubbing. One of the solutions was creating parallel foreign language versions of Hollywood films. Around 1930, the American companies opened a studio in joinville le pont France, where the same sets and wardrobe and even mass scenes were used for different time-sharing crews. Also, foreign unemployed actors, playwrights, and winners of photogenia contests were chosen and brought to Hollywood, where they shot parallel versions of the English-language films. These parallel versions had a lower budget, were shot at night and were directed by second-line American directors who did not speak the foreign language. The Spanish language crews included people like Luis Buñuel, Enrique Jardiel Poncela, Xavier Cugat, and Edgar Neville. The productions were not very successful in their intended markets, due to the following reasons. The lower budgets were apparent. Many theater actors had no previous experience in cinema. The original movies were often second-rate themselves since studios expected that the top productions would sell by themselves. The mix of foreign accents Castilian, Mexican, and Chilean for example in the Spanish case was odd for the audiences. Some markets lacked sound-equipped theaters. In spite of this, some productions like the Spanish version of Dracula compare favorably with the original. By the mid-1930s, synchronization had advanced enough for dubbing to become usual. Topic Classical Hollywood cinema and the Golden Age of Hollywood 1917 Classical Hollywood cinema is defined as a technical and narrative style characteristic of film from 1917 to 1960. During the Golden Age of Hollywood, which lasted from the end of the silent era in American cinema in the late 1920s to the early 1960s, thousands of movies were issued from the Hollywood studios. The start of the Golden Age was arguably when The Jazz Singer was released in 1927, ending the silent era and increasing box office profits for films as sound was introduced to feature films. Most Hollywood pictures adhered closely to a formula, western, slapstick comedy, musical, animated cartoon, biographical film biographical picture, and the same creative teams often worked on films made by the same studio. For example, Cedric Gibbons and Herbert Stothart always worked on MGM films, Alfred Newman worked at 20th Century Fox for 20 years, Cecil B. DeMille's films were almost all made at Paramount, and director Henry King's films were mostly made for 20th Century Fox. At the same time, one could usually guess which studio made which film, largely because of the actors who appeared in it. MGM, for example, claimed it had contracted more stars than there are in heaven. Each studio had its own style and characteristic touches which made it possible to know this, a trait that does not exist today. For example, 
To Have and Have Not 1944 is famous not only for the first pairing of actors Humphrey Bogart (1899–1957) and Lauren Bacall (1924–2014), but also for being written by two future winners of the Nobel Prize in Literature, Ernest Hemingway (1899–1961), the author of the novel on which the script was nominally based and William Faulkner (1897–1962), who worked on the screen adaptation. After the jazz singer was released in 1927, Warner Brothers gained huge success and were able to acquire their own string of movie theaters. After purchasing Stanley Theaters and First National Productions in 1928. MGM had also owned the Lowe's string of theaters since forming in 1924, and the Fox Film Corporation owned the Fox Theater strings as well. Also, RKO, a 1928 merger between Keith Orpheum Theaters and the Radio Corporation of America, responded to the Western Electric ERPI monopoly over sound in films and developed their own method, known as Photophone, to put sound in films. Paramount, which already acquired Balaban and Cats in 1926, would answer to the success of Warner Brothers and RKO, and by a number of theaters in the late 1920s as well, and would hold a monopoly on theaters in Detroit, Michigan. By the 1930s, almost all of the first-run metropolitan theaters in the United States were owned by the Big Five studios, MGM, Paramount Pictures, RKO, Warner Brothers, and 20th Century Fox. Topic: The studio system. Movie making was still a business, however, and motion picture companies made money by operating under the studio system. The major studios kept thousands of people on salary: actors, producers, directors, writers, stunt men, craftspersons, and technicians. They owned or leased movie ranches in rural Southern California for location shooting of westerns and other large-scale genre films. And they owned hundreds of theaters in cities and towns across the nation in 1920 film theaters that showed their films and that were always in need of fresh material. In 1930, MPPDA President Will Hayes created the Hayes Production Code, which followed censorship guidelines and went into effect after government threats of censorship expanded by 1930. However, the code was never enforced until 1934, after the Catholic watchdog organization The Legion of Decency, appalled by some of the provocative films and lurid advertising of the era later classified pre-code Hollywood threatened a boycott of motion pictures if it didn't go into effect. Those films that didn't obtain a seal of approval from the Production Code Administration had to pay a $25,000 fine and could not profit in the theaters, as the MPPDA controlled every theater in the country through the Big Five Studios. Throughout the 1930s, as well as most of the Golden Age, MGM dominated the film screen and had the top stars in Hollywood, and was also credited for creating the Hollywood star system altogether. Some MGM stars included, King of Hollywood, Clark Gable, Lionel Barrymore, Jean Harlow, Norma Shearer, Greta Garbo, Joan Crawford, Jeanette MacDonald and husband Jean Raymond, Spencer Tracy, Judy Garland, and Jean Kelly. But MGM did not stand alone. Another great achievement of U.S. cinema during this era came through Walt Disney's animation company. In 1937, Disney created the most successful film of its time, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. 
This distinction was promptly topped in 1939 when Selznick International created what is still when adjusted for inflation, the most successful film of all time, Gone with the Wind. Many film historians have remarked upon the many great works of cinema that emerged from this period of highly regimented filmmaking. One reason this was possible is that, with so many movies being made, not everyone had to be a big hit. A studio could gamble on a medium-budget feature with a good script and relatively unknown actors. Citizen Kane, directed by Orson Welles (1915 to 1985) and often regarded as the greatest film of all time, fits that description. In other cases, strong-willed directors like Howard Hawks (1896–1977), Alfred Hitchcock (1899–1980), and Frank Capra (1897–1991) battled the studios in order to achieve their artistic visions. The apogee of the studio system may have been the year 1939, which saw the release of such classics as The Wizard of Oz, Gone with the Wind, Stagecoach, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, Wuthering Heights, Only Angels Have Wings, Ninichka and Midnight. Among the other films from the Golden Age period that are now considered to be classics, Casablanca, It's a Wonderful Life, It Happened One Night, the original King Kong, Mutiny on the Bounty, Top Hat, City Lights, Red River, The Lady from Shanghai, Rear Window, On the Waterfront, Rebel Without a Cause, Some Like It Hot, and The Manchurian Candidate. Topic: Decline of the studio system, late 1940s. The studio system and the golden age of Hollywood succumbed to two forces that developed in the late 1940s: a federal antitrust action that separated the production of films from their exhibition, and the advent of television. In 1938, Walt Disney's Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs was released during a run of lackluster films from the major studios, and quickly became the highest grossing film released to that point. Embarrassingly for the studios, it was an independently produced animated film that did not feature any studio employed stars. This stoked already widespread frustration at the practice of block booking, in which studios would only sell an entire year's schedule of films at a time to theaters and use the lock-in to cover for releases of mediocre quality. Assistant Attorney General Thurman Arnold — a noted «trust buster» of the Roosevelt administration took this opportunity to initiate proceedings against the eight largest Hollywood studios in July 1938 for violations of the Sherman Antitrust Act. The federal suit resulted in five of the eight studios the Big Five, Warner Brothers, MGM, Fox, RKO and Paramount reaching a compromise with Arnold in October 1940 and signing a consent decree agreeing to, within three years, eliminate the block booking of short film subjects, in an arrangement known as, one shot, or full force, block booking eliminate the block booking of any more than five features in their theaters. No longer engage in blind buying or the buying of films by theater districts without seeing films beforehand and instead have trade showing, in which all 31 theater districts in the U.S. would see films every two weeks before showing movies in theaters. Set up an administration board in each theater district to enforce these requirements. The Little Three Universal Studios, United Artists, and Columbia Pictures, who did not own any theaters, refused to participate in the consent decree. 
A number of independent film producers were also unhappy with the compromise and formed a union known as the Society of Independent Motion Picture Producers and sued Paramount for the monopoly they still had over the Detroit theaters. As Paramount was also gaining dominance through actors like Bob Hope, Paulette Goddard, Veronica Lake, Betty Hutton, crooner Bing Crosby, Alan Ladd, and longtime actor for studio Gary Cooper II by 1942. The Big Five studios didn't meet the requirements of the consent of decree during World War II, without major consequence, but after the war ended they joined Paramount as defendants in the Hollywood antitrust case, as did the Little Three studios. The Supreme Court eventually ruled that the major studios' ownership of theaters and film distribution was a violation of the Sherman Antitrust Act. As a result, the studios began to release actors and technical staff from their contracts with the studios. This changed the paradigm of filmmaking by the major Hollywood studios, as each could have an entirely different cast and creative team. The decision resulted in the gradual loss of the characteristics which made Metro Goldwyn Mayer, Paramount Pictures, Universal Studios, Columbia Pictures, RKO Pictures, and 20th Century Fox Films immediately identifiable. Certain movie people, such as Cecil B. DeMille, either remained contract artists until the end of their careers or used the same creative teams on their films so that a DeMille film still looked like one whether it was made in 1932 or 1956. Topic. Impact, fewer films, larger individual budgets Also, the number of movies being produced annually dropped as the average budget soared, marking a major change in strategy for the industry. Studios now aim to produce entertainment that could not be offered by television, spectacular, larger-than-life productions. Studios also began to sell portions of their theatrical film libraries to other companies to sell to television. By 1949, all major film studios had given up ownership of their theaters. This was complemented with the 1952 miracle decision in the Joseph Burston Inc. v. Wilson case, in which the Supreme Court of the United States reversed its earlier position, from 1915's Mutual Film Corporation v. Industrial Commission of Ohio case, and stated that motion pictures were a form of art and were entitled to the protection of the First Amendment. U.S. laws could no longer censor films. By 1968, with film studios becoming increasingly defiant to its censorship function, the Motion Picture Association of America MPAA had replaced the Hayes Code which was now greatly violated after the government threat of censorship that justified the origin of the code had ended—with the film rating system. New Hollywood and post-classical cinema 1960s to 1980s Post-classical cinema is the term used to describe the changing methods of storytelling in the New Hollywood. It has been argued that new approaches to drama and characterization played upon audience expectations acquired in the classical period, chronology may be scrambled, storylines may feature twist endings, and lines between the antagonist and protagonist may be blurred. The roots of post-classical storytelling may be seen in film noir, in Rebel Without a Cause 1955, and in Hitchcock's storyline Shattering Psycho. 
The New Hollywood describes the emergence of a new generation of film school trained directors who had absorbed the techniques developed in Europe in the 1960s. The 1967 film Bonnie and Clyde marked the beginning of American cinema rebounding as well, as a new generation of films would afterwards gain success at the box offices as well. Filmmakers like Francis Ford Coppola, Steven Spielberg, George Lucas, Brian De Palma, Stanley Kubrick, Martin Scorsese, Roman Polanski, and William Friedkin came to produce fare that paid homage to the history of film and developed upon existing genres and techniques. Inaugurated by the 1969 release of Andy Warhol's Blue Movie, the phenomenon of adult erotic films being publicly discussed by celebrities like Johnny Carson and Bob Hope, and taken seriously by critics like Roger Ebert, a development referred to, by Ralph Blumenthal of The New York Times, as, "...porno chic." and later known as the Golden Age of Porn, began, for the first time, in modern American culture. According to award-winning author Tony Bentley, Radley Metzger's 1976 film The Opening of Misty Beethoven, based on the play Pygmalion by George Bernard Shaw and its derivative, My Fair Lady, and due to attaining a mainstream level in storyline and sets, is considered the crown jewel of this golden age in the 1970s the films of new hollywood filmmakers were often both critically acclaimed and commercially successful while the early New Hollywood films like Bonnie and Clyde and Easy Rider had been relatively low-budget affairs with amoral heroes and increased sexuality and violence, the enormous success enjoyed by Friedkin with The Exorcist, Spielberg with Jaws, Coppola with The Godfather and Apocalypse Now, Scorsese with Taxi Driver, Kubrick with 2001, A Space Odyssey, Polanski with Chinatown, and Lucas with American Graffiti and Star Wars, respectively helped to give rise to the modern blockbuster and induced studios to focus ever more heavily on trying to produce enormous hits. The increasing indulgence of these young directors did not help. Often, they'd go over schedule and over budget, thus bankrupting themselves or the studio. The three most famous examples of this are Coppola's Apocalypse Now and One from the Heart and particularly Michael Cimino's Heaven's Gate, which single-handedly bankrupted United Artists. However, Apocalypse Now eventually made its money back and gained widespread recognition as a masterpiece, winning the Palme d'Or at Cannes. Topic: Rise of the home video market, 1980s to 1990s. The 1980s and 1990s saw another significant development. The full acceptance of home video by studios opened a vast new business to exploit. Films such as Showgirls, The Secret of NIMH, and The Shawshank Redemption, which may have performed poorly in their theatrical run, were now able to find success in the video market. It also saw the first generation of filmmakers with access to videotapes emerge. Directors such as Quentin Tarantino and Paul Thomas Anderson had been able to view thousands of films and produced films with vast numbers of references and connections to previous works. Tarantino has had a number of collaborations with director Robert Rodriguez. Rodriguez directed the 1992 action film El Mariachi, which was a commercial success after grossing $2 million against a budget of $7,000. This, along with the explosion of independent film and ever-decreasing costs for filmmaking, changed the landscape of American movie making once again and led a renaissance of filmmaking among Hollywood's lower and middle classes. 
those without access to studio financial resources. With the rise of the DVD in the 21st century, DVDs have quickly become even more profitable to studios and have led to an explosion of packaging extra scenes, extended versions, and commentary tracks with the films. Topic Modern cinema The drive to produce a spectacle on the movie screen has largely shaped American cinema ever since. Spectacular epics which took advantage of new widescreen processes had been increasingly popular from the 1950s onwards. Since then, American films have become increasingly divided into two categories, blockbusters and independent films. Studios have focused on relying on a handful of extremely expensive releases every year in order to remain profitable. Such blockbusters emphasize spectacle, star power, and high production value, all of which entail an enormous budget. Blockbusters typically rely upon star power and massive advertising to attract a huge audience. A successful blockbuster will attract an audience large enough to offset production costs and reap considerable profits. Such productions carry a substantial risk of failure, and most studios release blockbusters that both over- and underperform in a year. Classic blockbusters from this period include Raiders of the Lost Ark, E.T. the Extraterrestrial, Blade Runner, Scarface, Risky Business, Ghostbusters, The Terminator, The Goonies, Back to the Future, The Breakfast Club, Beverly Hills Cop, Top Gun, Aliens, Lethal Weapon, Fatal Attraction, Broadcast News, Wall Street, The Princess Bride, Dirty Dancing, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, The Naked Gun, Rain Man, Die Hard, Batman, Driving Miss Daisy, The Little Mermaid, Dances with Wolves, Goodfellas, Home Alone, Pretty Woman, Ghost, Total Recall, Thelma and Louise, The Silence of the Lambs, Beauty and the Beast, Terminator 2, Judgment Day, Basic Instinct, Unforgiven, The Bodyguard, Aladdin, Sister Act, Mrs. Doubtfire, Sleepless in Seattle, The Fugitive, Jurassic Park, Schindler's List, The Nightmare Before Christmas, The Lion King, Forrest Gump, Pulp Fiction, Clueless, Apollo 13, Toy Story, 7, Braveheart, Independence Day, Matilda, Jerry Maguire, Scream, Good Will Hunting, Men in Black, Austin Powers, My Best Friend's Wedding, Titanic, Saving Private Ryan, Mulan, Fight Club, The Matrix, The Green Mile, The Sixth Sense, American Beauty, Star Wars, Episode I, The Phantom Menace, Gladiator, Harry Potter, Ocean's Eleven, Moulin Rouge, Legally Blonde, The Princess Diaries, Gangs of New York, The Lord of the Rings, Pirates of the Caribbean, Mean Girls, The Notebook, Million Dollar Baby, Brokeback Mountain, Little Miss Sunshine, The Departed, Spider-Man, The Born Identity, The Dark Knight, Inception and The Curious Case of Benjamin Button. Studios supplement these movies with independent productions, made with small budgets and often independently of the studio corporation. Movies made in this manner typically emphasize high professional quality in terms of acting, directing, screenwriting, and other elements associated with production, and also upon creativity and innovation. These movies usually rely upon critical praise or niche marketing to garner an audience. Because of an independent film's low budget, a successful independent film can have a high profit-to-cost ratio while a failure will incur minimal losses, allowing for studios to sponsor dozens of such productions in addition to their high-stakes releases. 
American independent cinema was revitalized in the late 1980s and early 1990s when another new generation of moviemakers, including Spike Lee, Steven Soderbergh, Kevin Smith and Quentin Tarantino made movies like, respectively, Do the Right Thing, Sex, Lies, and Videotape, Clerks and Reservoir Dogs. In terms of directing, screenwriting, editing, and other elements, these movies were innovative and often irreverent, playing with and contradicting the conventions of Hollywood movies. Furthermore, their considerable financial successes and crossover into popular culture re-established the commercial viability of independent film. Since then, the independent film industry has become more clearly defined and more influential in American cinema. Many of the major studios have capitalized on this by developing subsidiaries to produce similar films, for example, Fox Searchlight Pictures. To a lesser degree in the early 21st century, film types that were previously considered to have only a minor presence in the mainstream movie market began to arise as more potent American box office draws. These include foreign language films such as Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon and Hero and documentary films such as Super Size Me, March of the Penguins, and Michael Moore's Bowling for Columbine and Fahrenheit 9-11. <laughs> Hollywood and politics In the 1930s, the Democrats and the Republicans saw money in Hollywood. President Franklin Roosevelt saw a huge partnership with Hollywood. He used the first real potential of Hollywood's stars in a national campaign. Melvin Douglas toured Washington in 1939 and met the key New Dealers. Topic. Political endorsements Endorsements letters from leading actors were signed, radio appearances and printed advertising were made. Movie stars were used to draw a large audience into the political view of the party. By the 1960s, John F. Kennedy was a new, young face for Washington, and his strong friendship with Frank Sinatra exemplified this new era of glamour. The last moguls of Hollywood were gone and younger, newer executives and producers began generating more liberal ideas. Celebrities and money attracted politicians into the high class, glittering Hollywood lifestyle. As Ronald Brownstein wrote in his book, The Power and the Glitter, television in the 1970s and 1980s was an enormously important new media in politics and Hollywood helped in that media with actors making speeches on their political beliefs, like Jane Fonda against the Vietnam War. Despite many celebrities and producers being left-leaning and tending to support the Democratic Party, this era produced many Republican actors and producers. Former actor Ronald Reagan became governor of California and subsequently became the 40th President of the United States. It continued with Arnold Schwarzenegger as California's governor in 2003. Topic. Political donations Today, donations from Hollywood help to fund federal politics. On February 20, 2007, for example, Democratic then-presidential candidate Barack Obama had a $2,300 a plate Hollywood gala, being hosted by DreamWorks founders David Geffen, Jeffrey Katzenberg, and Steven Spielberg at the Beverly Hilton. Topic: <laughs> Spread to world markets. 
In 1912, American film companies were largely immersed in the competition for the domestic market. It was difficult to satisfy the huge demand for films created by the Nickelodeon boom. Motion picture patents company members such as Edison Studios, also sought to limit competition from French, Italian, and other imported films. Exporting films, then, became lucrative to these companies. Vitagraph Studios was the first American company to open its own distribution offices in Europe, establishing a branch in London in 1906, and a second branch in Paris shortly after. Other American companies were moving into foreign markets as well, and American distribution abroad continued to expand until the mid 1920s. Originally, a majority of companies sold their films indirectly. However, since they were inexperienced in overseas trading, they simply sold the foreign rights to their films to foreign distribution firms or export agents. Gradually, London became a centre for the international circulation of US films. Many British companies made a profit by acting as the agents for this business, and by doing so, they weakened British production by turning over a large share of the UK market to American films. By 1911, approximately 60 to 70% of films imported into Great Britain were American. The United States was also doing well in Germany, Australia, and New Zealand. More recently, as globalization has started to intensify, and the United States government has been actively promoting free trade agendas and trade on cultural products, Hollywood has become a worldwide cultural source. The success on Hollywood export markets can be known not only from the boom of American multinational media corporations across the globe but also from the unique ability to make big budget films that appeal powerfully to popular tastes in many different cultures. With globalization, movie production has been clustered in Hollywood for several reasons. The United States has the largest single home market in dollar terms. Entertaining and highly visible Hollywood movies have global appeal, and the role of English as a universal language contributes to compensating for higher fixed costs of production. In the meantime, Hollywood has moved more deeply into Chinese markets, although influenced by China's censorship. Films made in China are censored, strictly avoiding themes like ghosts, violence, murder, horror, and demons. Such plot elements risk being cut. Hollywood has had to make approved films, corresponding to official Chinese standards, but with aesthetic standards sacrificed to box office profits. Even Chinese audiences found it boring to wait for the release of great American movies dubbed in their native language. Topic. Role of women Women are statistically underrepresented in creative positions in the center of the U.S. film industry, Hollywood. This underrepresentation has been called the celluloid ceiling, a variant on the employment discrimination term, glass ceiling. In 2013, the Dot top paid actors less than pre greater than slash pre greater than dot 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 made two and a half times as much money as the top paid actresses. O L D E R male actors make more than their female equals in age with female movie stars mock ing the most money on average per film at age 34 while male stars earn the most at 51 
The 2013 Celluloid Ceiling Report conducted by the Center for the Study of Women in Television and Film at San Diego State University collected a list of statistics gathered from 2,813 individuals employed by the 250 top domestic grossing films of 2012. Women accounted for 18% of all directors, executive producers, producers, writers, cinematographers, and editors. This reflected no change from 2011 and only a 1% increase from 1998. 9% of all directors. 15% of writers. 25% of all producers 20% of all editors 2% of all cinematographers 38% of films employed zero or one woman in the roles considered, 23% employed two women, 28% employed three to five women, and 10% employed six to nine women. A New York Times article stated that only 15% of the top films in 2013 had women for a lead acting role. The author of the study noted that, "...the percentage of female speaking roles has not increased much since the 1940s when they hovered around 25% to 28%. Since 1998, women's representation in behind-the-scenes roles other than directing has gone up just 1%. Women directed the same percent of the 250 top grossing films in 2012 9% as they did in 1998 topic see also american comedy films american film institute History of animation in the United States History of film List of films in the public domain in the United States Motion Picture Association of America Film Rating System National Film Registry General List of Cinema of the World Photography in the United States of America Cinema of North America equals equals notes <laughs>